Hello, everybody. So today, this is a totally different show. I'm Donya Williams, and I am going to be interviewing both Brian and Sheffy and Loretta Bellamy. Now, um, this is um a personal. So these are personal bios that I'm about to read out, that I'm about to say out to you guys. And um, it's going to be a great show. It's going to be very similar to the John Yeldale show that we did where Brian was interviewing me, and now it's been switched, where I am interviewing Brian and Loretta. So first, Brian. Brian Sheffy is my cousin of love, my brother of heart, and he is has been, um, he's a speaker, he's an author, and he's this, this awesome genealogist that continues to help people on a regular basis on how to do and search out your family. And he has the book that he's written, Practical Genealogy, is forever available. And you guys um, can pull it up, get it. I suggest it because it tells you what to do, how to do it, and precise steps because that's who Brian is. So welcome to the show, Brian. And then there's my Loretta, who I unfriend every other week on Facebook. Um <laughs> Because she does things, guys. She does things that just, you know, boggles my mind. But Loretta is also an awesome genealogist. She is the guru of newspapers. If you want an obituary, she will find it. She is also one of our researchers with Genealogy Adventures. And um, she's awesome. Don't tell her I said that. Oh, dang, she hears me. No, but she's awesome. And <laughs> And I just love these two people. So, guys, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have to say it's kind of neat not being in the captain's chair this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so you got to share the stuff. But, um, so what is this show about? This show is about somehow he. this man is connected to every last one of us. All three of us sitting here. His name is Moses Williams. He is the father of 45 children. And I think in the um, advertising, Brian said that he's probably the last connection to the American Revolution. I'm going to totally and utterly agree with him for that. Um, why do we think that? Because he was born in 1769, which was what, at least 10 years before the revolution, or uh, yeah, mm -hmm. well, 10 years before the revolution even started. Mm -hmm. So, um, why are we having this conversation? We're having this conversation because since the re research started, a lot of people have been connecting themselves. And it's possible because the man had 45 kids. But the start of this research, I want everybody to understand and know that this was us. I, I, it's no other way for me to say that. We can't, we, we found it. We conquered we and we attacked it and i attacked it because i didn't want to attack it i was made to attack it <laughs> and and we still we did it so that's why i'm going to be there and this is a a historic type of research and i don't want that credit to go to everybody i'm just going to keep that honest um and not only that that includes me because what you guys fail to realize is when we first got into this research and I found art one article, Brian found another article, we discussed it. We said, you know what, this has to be tackled from a lot of different areas. And so we turned around and we added other people in it. There were, I want to say seven, me, Brian, Loretta, Sheila, God rest her soul, Hamad, and Sharon. Yes. No, that's six. Six. Yes, six. Yes. Mm -hmm. that were a part of the research for doing um, Moses Williams. But there were two people that were over the top and you're looking at them. So with that being said, that credit, it goes to them. It goes to these two people right here. We were just the hands that did what they told us to do. We went in the direction that they wanted us to go. I want people to know that Brian and Loretta are the true masterminds of finding the amount of kids that we found when it comes to Moses Williams. I applaud you guys. 
I thank you guys. And I'm mad at you guys for making me do it. <laughs> thank <this> you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, because, you know, I, I will be honest. I mean, I wasn't a bully, but I was a bit of a yes, genealogy. I was a bit of a genealogy meanie. Um, there was just something about, you know, when we were putting the pieces the puzzle together, when you came across that newspaper article that said he was 115 years old in 1884 when he died, you know, we both kind of did the math, you know, and this is, again is really important in genealogy, do the basics, do the math. Because mm -hmm. at first we thought the article was about our three times great grandfather, Moses Williams Jr. Mm -hmm. And we did the math and it just immediately dispelled that. There's no way that uh, someone 115 in 1884 could have been born in the 1790s. Right. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me, couldn't. let me, let me push that. Let me push that. So basically the way this happened guys was that I was scrolling through newspapers.com. I was trying to find some information on my third time, three times great grandfather, Moses Jr. And um, I was going through and I came across this particular article. And basically the article just, it, the article said the fecundity, talked about the fecundity of a Negro and how this man was 65 years old, but he looked 50. And he was actually the father of 45 kids. And when I saw that, I was like, I, I'm not, I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to show it to Brian so he could see it. And I was like, oh, look, Moses Jr. Moses has 45 kids. Ooh. And that was it. I wasn't going no further than that. Um, they said that in the article, it said first wife was 20 girls and two, three boys. Second wife was 20 girls and two boys. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know at least one of the, you know, I, Okay. I, I don't, I know what, as far as I was concerned, because we thought it was the third, you know, that that was our Moses. I was like, well, I know one of the kids and that was it. And I wasn't pressed to find her other 39 sisters and five brothers. It would, didn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. So I showed it to Brian. And when I showed it to Brian, I, he was like, wow. Okay. And he says that he was a meanie. He was a bully. <laughs> <laughs> would nobody say he was a bully because then he turns around and he finds the obituary for Moses and the, mo and the obituary stated that Moses was 115 years old and that 43 of his kids were still living and this was in 1884 and I added it up and I had already knew that Moses the first person that we were originally looking for was born in 1791. We had records that showed when this man was born. And we were like, I I, I just kind of looked and I said, um, hey, Mo, hey, that that's that doesn't make sense. And he said, What? I said, 115 don't add. I said, those numbers don't add up. If you subtract 1884, if you subtract 1791 from 1884, you're not gonna get 115. He was like, yeah, I know. That's his father. I was like, oh, okay. Oh. He said, yeah, we're and doing I was calm. Research. Yeah. I was calm as a cucumber. He was. And I, and I have to say, it just, the whole, it just, Moses spoke to me in a yeah. way that few of our ancestors have. He really did reach out through the ages, and he really spoke to me. And we already knew how many kids that Moses Williams Jr. had. Then speaking to Loretta, and again, we're going to get into the kids later on in the show, but um, and Loretta, you can talk a little bit about Martha Ann. We know how, you know, Loretta had already done, and Hamad had already done such an amazing job researching Martha Ann Williams' line. And we know how many kids, she, how many kids did she have, actually, with um, Edward Settles? It's, it's out, the jury's out. Um, if you listen to Old Folks Tale, they said that she had 11 we've been able to confirm for sure six or seven. The 11 mm -hmm. is still, uh, we have, I have what I call suspect children of hers, um, which I do believe that they are hers, but I have not added them to the tree as of yet. Um, but I do believe that she has more. Now the question is how many are her and Edwards? That's the story. Right. Um, so I believe that at least five of the ones that we have are her and Edwards for sure. Um, and the other ones- But she, I, had, she had a- 
So she had a large family. Mm -hmm. Moses Williams Jr. had a large family. And then I think I blew the whole team's mind. And I said, look, I'm going to keep the math really simple. Let's just say that each one of Moses Williams Sr.'s kids had 10 kids each. Mm -hmm. That's 450 grandkids. It's like, and let's say that those grandkids had 10 kids each. That's 4,500 great grandkids in one. Y'all see why one, I want to do this stuff. I didn't want to do it. You didn't. You wanted to dodge yeah. that bullet. But that, you know, when Donnie and I keep joking about how he really, you know, Moses really is one. I'm not saying he's the only one, but he is one of the fathers of Edgefield. <laughs> Actually, the old 96. His kids were just all over the old 96, principally in kind of Newberry, Lawrence, Edgefield, Barnwell. Um, and we knew how our family married. Cousins married cousins, married cousins. Because again, you're talking about a very, really, really rural part of South Carolina. And that, that, you know, that was the significance. And that actually explained a lot of crazy DNA matches that I was seeing in my DNA match list on this side of the family. Did that? What did it re reveal to you? Um, to you two. You can go first. Yeah, Moses was related to everybody. Um, basically, <laughs> if I had to sum it up, if I had to sum it up in a nutshell, um, I told Donya years ago that there needs to be a sign, "Welcome to Edgefield." Like if you're driving into Edgefield, the sign needs to read, "Welcome to Edgefield," where everybody in the town is related. <laughs> <laughs> And for the benefit so of the audience, it did, doesn't matter if you're white or black. Mm -hmm. Everyone in that county is related to each other. In some kind other. of way. If they've been there, for, if, they're, if their ancestors have been there for any length of time, this is one of the reasons why everyone is related. Yeah. And, and to be honest with you, when I read the article and, and when you guys, you know, you guys had started on it and then we started talking about it and I was like, oh, hell no. Mm -mm. You're right. <laughs> she was the only one. This is why I only unfriend her every other week because sometimes we be on the same page. Mm -hmm. But yeah, she was she was right along with me. I was like, nobody wants to do this. Doing this. And, <laughs> and I think part of the reason why I jumped into it is for the exact same reason that I didn't want to get into it is because 45 kids, that's impossible. So there's a part of me that says, no way. But then there was the other part that says, oh, yeah, I, I don't believe this. I I, I got to find it. We, we got to do this because I, I need to see it for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't I didn't care. Now, for me, why I my feelings were. I'm going to be honest, you know, once I my shock was more for the fact that we had to do the research as opposed to the fact that there were so many kids because my mom comes from a very large family. And so for me, it actually began to make sense as to why my mother came from a very large family. Um, I'm like, oh, so she, so this is just that whole gene thing. And she, she and her, my grandmother inherited that gene because my grandmother had 14 kids. Her mother had 10 kids. And then um, they're her parents, her mother, Molly, turned around and I think Molly has like 10 or 11 kids, maybe 12. Yeah, Molly so, has quite a few. <laughs> yeah, Molly got quite a few kids. So, and I'm like, okay, well, I, I could see why my grandmother, I could see that. But I wasn't even, matter of fact, I wasn't even looking at Molly. I was more so looking at my senior line because that was who we were finding him through. Didn't even dawn on me to go to that other side because we didn't know stuff until we started doing the research. And on the senior line, my my grandfather, my great grandfather's mom had sixteen kids. So it really didn't. It really wasn't a big deal to me the number of children. It was the fact we had to do it. The other important thing that we realized was that if you are a descendant of Moses Williams, and there are no fertility issues in the more kind of contemporary generations of your family. We realize our whole extended family were having, the women in particular were having kids every 18 months to two years, like clockwork, mm -hmm. like clockwork. And actually that's kind of helped us in our genealogy because we notice gaps. If there's a gap that's larger than say two years between children, that's when we start surmising, well, there may have been an infant death or you know 
child mm-hmm. didn't didn't particularly live long. But um, I have to say that was kind of impressive. You know, it's it's almost like the most reliable train system in, in the universe. If you're a Moses Williams descendant, and if, uh, his first wife, Miss Haygood, or Mariah, and his second wife, Mar- Mariah Stallworth, you genetically have the capability of having kids every 18 months to two years. And I even look at it in my immediate family. You know, there, there aren't, I mean, there's a couple of gaps in my mom's and her siblings. Um, but by and large, boom, boom, boom. One right after the other. Right after the other. I, I actually have the gene. It, it's an mm-hmm. actual gene. And it's a real gene too, you guys. It's it's a real gene because um, I, I had to be tested and found out that I have that gene. So let's go into Moses, okay? Yes. Let's get into All this right. timeline. Because okay. the three of us, we are determined to show you that speaking about genealogy, genealogical research on a TV show does not have to be boring. It doesn't. It (laughs) doesn't. It doesn't. Um, um, It's very exciting, actually, especially for other researchers. But when you, as a person who's not into genealogy, if you hear about somebody who got 45 kids, you're looking like, excuse me, what? (laughs) Well, again, even some of the Facebook comments as you're bringing at the timeline, some of the one question, and it's a legitimate question, but one question was, was he a polygamist? Did he come from a culture of polygamy? And I guess my response to that was and is, well, he was born in this country. His enslaved mother was born in this country, so there wouldn't have been an African culture for them to tap into. Mm-hmm. Um, but in this case, he had one group of kids with his first wife, Miss Haygood. And I, one day before I close my eyes on this earth, she will have her her flowers, that woman will have her proper first name. Biolog- DNA-wise, you know, it's telling us that she was um, a member of the Haygood family. So he had one group of kids with Miss Haygood. She died. He married a much younger woman, Mariah Stallworth, and had a whole other group of kids. There was no overlap between the two. Mm-hmm. There, was, there was no polygamy. He was just very good at fathering children. Mm-hmm. And I guess the way and we're very good at having them. Because um, when I sit here, as, even as a man, as I sit here, <laughs> when I sit here and think about it, those women spent most of their lives pregnant. Yes, they yes. did. Yes, they did. Yes, they pregnant did. Pregnant raised, and raising kids. And the other thing to note with Moses, and we'll probably cycle back around to this, is he was having, he was still having children when his oldest children were when having children. children. Children and his oldest grandchildren were having children, and everyone's recycling the same half dozen to about eight mm-hmm. first names for their kids. And if you want to know about a genealogical nightmare or a challenge, that's one for you. When you're looking at about, I don't know, how many Loretta would you say that between 12 to 15 Moses Williams born around, say, within even within the 1830s? We I little- have. Yeah, twelve I have to fifteen. At least ten, at least ten. Mm-hmm. Yeah, at least and they're 10. all different. And they're all different, but they they range from Edgefield to Barnwell to Aiken. Um, they're mm-hmm. all over. They're all over. And again, as genealogists, if you're not paying attention, it is very easy to conflate two completely different Moses Williams, born say in 1840, mm-hmm. mistake them for one another swap them for one another or merge them together when they were actually two completely different men. Mm-hmm. So there's our timeline. Moses, as we know, he was born in 1769. He was born to his enslaver, who was also his father, and we're going to get into that next. Daniel Williams II. He, he, Daniel Williams was resident in Hanover, which means that Moses was born in Hanover. Unfortunately, we do not know the first name of Moses's mother. We suspect we've seen a deed, um, and Donna, you, uh, either of you can talk about this as well. Uh, there were two women that were specifically called out in Daniel Williams' 1801 will, who had the choice to live with whichever one of his children they wanted to live with. There were only ever three people at that level who ever had it? Who were ever given a choice about what family, what enslaved 
living family member they could choose to live with. It was a woman called Candace. There was another woman called Lizzie or Elizabeth. And then there's Moses. The Williams family and their, the enslaving Williams family in their own way, I think as much as slavery would allow, were calling out the name of their enslaved kin. I still have to wrap my head around it still kind of kind of working through it but i think you know within the con confines of slavery they kind of called out their enslaved family members so what, what so what were your feelings on that oh you're asking yeah no i agree i'm huh? sorry brian you know i'm still doing my other stuff um <laughs> i'm sorry yes i i kind of agree with you on that um one of the things that i noticed with the Daniel Williams, the Williams family as a whole, they would definitely let you know who they, who they were connected to. And I'm talking about the white Williams. I, I'm not even talking about Moses and them. They didn't have to do it. They were very um, specific about these three people and what they could and could not do in every deed that they had for them. Mm -hmm. It was always something really specific about, okay, well, these two older women, they're older. They can do what they can go to whoever they want. So basically telling enslaved folks, you can do whatever you want to do. Just do it with whomever you choose to do it with. You mm -hmm. have that choice. Then there's Moses. Well, Moses, he at one point had a choice where if he didn't go, he could. He had the choice to either go to his uh, father's, his father's son, which was his brother, or I think an uncle. Because if that, mm -hmm. uh, if mm -hmm. a son wasn't doing what if his brother oh was it was a grandson it was a, it was a grandson of daniel williams which yeah so it was so, a, grandson and a, a, nephew. Or an uncle. So a grandson so, and a nephew right that's right okay. so Dan, daniel williams the second's grandson who was moses's nephew i had to sit here and work that out in my head for a bit but yeah that, that was the family relationship and the other person that he went to, that he had the choice that if Davis, because his name was Davis, and if Davis mm -hmm. didn't treat him right, then it was an uncle. He yeah. So Davis's father kind of knew his son's character and just put that caveat. If Davis mistreated Moses in any way, shape, or form, Moses had the right to choose where he lived. And there is a stinger in that tale. And we're going to come up to that later on in the time, in this timeline. So, so one question. So one question that people probably have is, well, how do you know that Daniel Williams II was actually Moses' father? Well, all three of us, we have specific DNA links to the white enslaving Henderson and Keeling families, which were Daniel Williams II's ancestors. We wouldn't have those DNA connections in any other way, shape, or form, but through Moses Williams Sr., and his father, Danny Williams, and that kind of um that that's 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 what did it for us. That's how we know. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's done. Mm -hmm. So 1769, we can place Moses in Virginia, uh, specifically in Hanover County. 1790 is the first time that Daniel Williams II actually appears in the federal census in. Granville County, North Carolina. So I know that that's a big gap. We're not entirely sure when Daniel Williams got to North Carolina. And remember, wherever an enslaver went, they took their enslaved people with them. So because we don't know exa exactly, we don't have a precise year for Daniel, we don't have a precise year for Moses. We don't know exactly when he was there, but we can put him in Granville in 1790. Now comes a whole series of some really unusual deeds. Um, honestly, I'm still grappling with some of them um, because they don't seem to have actually been enacted. They were done, they were executed, they were filed in a courthouse, they had a seal, but the contents of them don't seem to have been enacted and we're not. I'm still not entirely sure why that was done. 1792, there's a Newberry County, South Carolina deed. Um, it's deed book C, pages 294 to 5, written on the 28th of July, 1792. Moses is named in a deed between Daniel Williams II and his brother, Major John Williams, and a John Williams Jr. I'm still researching who this John Williams Jr. was, because there is no, there was no John mentioned in Major John Williams' will. 
So could be a father and a son. And there's so many John Williams in this family. Mm-hmm. And again, rather than just make the assumption that, the, that those two are father and son, slowly working through the papers to, to, act, to find the paper trail to actually figure out who Junior was. So his brother, so basically Daniel's brother, John, he's over in Newberry. Daniel's Williams is still in North Carolina. I'm just, so the hypothesis is obviously because Moses was enslaved by Daniel, he was also Daniel's son, he's more than likely with his father. What do you two kind of think about that hypothesis? Do you think he was still in North Carolina or do you think he may have been in South Carolina? Given the research that we've done with the women and, and well, not just the women, with the children, I am thinking that Moses may have been in South Carolina because all of the the women are listing their birth place as South Carolina. I would agree. I would say the same thing. I think he, you know, was was in South Carolina as well because that's the only way you can reconcile the women being born in South Carolina. It's the only thing that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And, and the way we can go about because we know because I know a question will come and say, well, if the women saying they're in South Carolina and he's in North Carolina, how can you reconcile that? Y'all have to remember everything that we're doing with Moses. It includes a culmination of DNA from several different accounts that we deal with that people share with us from all of that it is a culmination of dna it's not just one it's not just us three it's many people so we know that we connect to these women these children these sons and still be able to you know do what we need Mm -hmm. to do that's why we know (laughs) now on the very same day in the very same deed book on the very next page, there is another deed. And this is, I'm still grappling with what kind of deed this is. It is referred to as a, and it's actually in the language. I don't know if you can actually bring that up from the slide, Donnie, it's the link at the bottom. It is called a secret trust deed. And so I'm gonna veer a little way as I do a little bit of reading. So, a se- so what I have found since is a secret trust is a trust which arises when property, including human beings as enslaved people, is left to a person referred to as the legatee under a will on the understanding that they will hold the property as trustee for the benefit of beneficiaries who are not named in the will. So in this secret trust deed, Daniel Williams, who is described as being of North Carolina, conveyed Moses and 26 others other enslaved people to Major John Williams and John Williams Jr. This is the second time that names popped up like that, who were living in Newberry. So again, there's that cross between North Carolina and South Carolina. Um, Okay. So 1795, there's another deed involving Daniel Williams. Moses is mentioned. And again, involving Grant, it looks as though by this point, it's something to do with um, Granville County, North Carolina. 1798, D Book D, 2, page 265, dated 22 January, 1798, Daniel Williams II, who is now described as being of Lawrence County, South Carolina, bill of sale to Joseph Williams of Rockingham County. And in this deed, Moses is actually described as six foot. That's the first description. He was a tall dude for the time, for the time mm-hmm. period, he was a tall dude. It's the first description that we actually get of him. Now, the reason why I say it looks as though none of these deeds were actually enacted is because Daniel Williams actually dies and I always destroy this county name. Pasquatank. Pasquatank. Uh, North Carolina in 1801. That, that name just does not readily come to me. I've got a block with it. Um, and Moses is named in that will. And he um, is passed from Daniel Williams II to Daniel's son, Joseph Williams, who is described as being a Bo- who was living in Orange County, North Carolina at the time, but ends up dying in Newbury 
County, South Carolina in 1815. And that's the story that Donnie was telling you about in his will. Moses is left to his son, Davis Williams, on, with, it, with that caveat. And this is where assumptions can sometimes lead genealogists astray. For, and again, you, uh, all of us can, can kind of spend a little, about five minutes talking about this. In my experience, when it, when it, it didn't happen, I haven't seen it a lot in my research when an enslaved person could choose who they wanted to live to. I guess it was on the understanding that they would have to choose a member of the enslaver who's died, immediate family, one of his heirs or her heirs, one of their kids, you know, someone really close to the family. So I just assumed that was the case with, with Moses, um, that if he was going to choose anyone, that it would have to be someone who was a close member of the Williams family. And it would, scroll on to the next part of the timeline. I told you there was going to be a stinger in this one. It looks like he didn't. Um, we're going to go back to his first wife, who's Miss Haygood. I could never work out why Moses ended up in Barnwell, of all places, because I would have assumed he would have been in Edgefield, Lawrence, or Newberry. That's where the white, that's where his most immediate white enslaving family members were. But he's all the way down in Barnwell. And the Williams, there are Williams families, families in Barnwell, but they are not members of this Williams family. And again, this is what's really important with research. There is a Williams family Y DNA study that is freely available online. And how, how, um, Loretta, how many did we figure out there were? Were there eight or nine different unrelated Williams family groups? Yeah, there were quite a few. There, there, there were, were quite a few. There were quite a few. Quite a few. Yeah, Moses actually comes from um, John the Wealthy Welshman. Yeah. <clears throat> and John the Wealthy Welshman was a uh, whiskey. He was a whiskey maker. He was a whiskey, he was a whiskey yeah. maker. And so... Um, our line goes back to him. We we literally connect via DNA. Once again, remember, culmination of DNA people going back to John the Wealthy Welshman. So if you were to Google John the Wealthy Welshman, you would be able to see the DNA projects that Brian is talking about. I want to put mm -hmm. that out. So he's just, he's just one of them because if there was a good seven or eight kind of um, other groups amazing study and in its own way it was really really helpful for um for our genealogy but it did raise some questions because um it didn't matter what williams group you're looking at everyone was calling their naming at least one son william williams mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. bane of our research existence gray hairs <laughs> gray hairs what little hair i have left it's gray yeah. just trying to figure this stuff out um, unfortunately, there is a 55-year record, a uh, gap in records that we're still trying to, to work through. But I had my real kind of aha moment when re reviewing the 1870 census where Moses and his second wife, Mariah Stallworth, are living with some of their kids. They're living at Red Oak in Barnwell. And remember, you two, well, the whole group, including Sharon Hamada, kept saying, I don't understand how Moses went out of the Williams family and became part of the ens extended enslaving Haygood family in Barnwell. And then I'm thinking about it. Oh, he got to choose. And he did choose. Mm -hmm. yeah. He chose to be with his wife's enslavers. Um, and it was it was really as, as kind of simple as that. I mean, I can't think of any other explanation. I don't see the Williams selling him outside of the family. Mm -hmm. Because as far as I can see, and again, you guys can have you guys have your impressions. I don't see the Williams family of North Carolina and, and the 96, our our family. I didn't I just don't see them selling their enslaved family members out of the family. What is your impression of them? Well, at that point, I guess you would have to figure that Daniel and Joseph and maybe John Jr., they were all deceased at that point. So they were the one that were calling the shots, so to speak. 
they were making sure that those wills stayed in motion, that they stayed within a certain family. And if they're deceased, then he may have had a little bit of leeway and say, you know what? They're not here anymore. I'm going where I want. I'm out. Mm -hmm. And legally, because Daniel, because um, Joseph Williams didn't specifically say he had to choose a Williams family member, they said, listen, the dude said I could choose who I want to live with. I chose. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry it ain't y'all, but I chose. <laughs> and let's be clear. Um, it could have been family anyway. We don't, you know, we don't this know who, you know, that that had good family, who was married into who or whatever. We, we haven't gone, we haven't dug deep into hay goods yet. I have. Mm -hmm. I have. Well, Remember, the hate the hate goods are one of our strongest possibilities of why all of our family group has links to the Gullah Geechee, because they start life off in and around Charleston and Georgetown. They're that part, and they slow, you know, and over the kind of early decades of the, the 1700s, they slowly work their way into the old 96 in and around Newbury. So do you see Williams marrying get mm -hmm. hate goods yet? Okay. Nope. They tend to marry into, I guess, what you would call Protestant, uh, French, Angli Anglican, Protestant families. That that seemed to be their preference. All right. So, so I don't then... know what they would have made about about a bunch of well, uh, Welsh Methodists. Um, then 1880 again, Moses and Mariah are now they're living in Richland, Barnwell, and then on the seventh of October, 1884, Moses dies. In Barnwell. And not dies, died. And and that is the timeline of Moses Williams. Um, but I need to be clear on another thing. Pocahontas. We've had people who have made the assumption, please tell me if I'm saying this right, Loretta. Um, <laughs> who made the assumption that Moses is connected to Pocahontas? I'm gonna categorically okay. So rather than just front load that with my answer, we know that he is a descendant of Daniel Williams, the white enslaving descendants of John the Wealthy Welshman and John the Wealthy Welshman himself, incredibly well-documented. Mm -hmm. There is no link with Pocahontas or Pocahontas's people. There's, no, there's even no indication that there's any Native American. Mm -hmm. In that. Now, the other issue that we have is we really don't know who Moses's mother was. We suspect it's one of the two older women, Candace or Lizzie, but at this point still can't categorically say that it's one of those two. So if we don't know who his mother was, and no one at this point knows who his mother was with any certainty, we can't say that he, how he descends from someone who lived in the 1600s. We just, we just can't. Mm -hmm. that, that's just bad. That's just bad genealogy. Yeah. Now, I'm not my saying that the person that, that, that who, that anyone who feels that Pocahontas is connected to Mo, we, we're just saying that, we're not saying that you're not connected to Moses, to Pocahontas. We're just saying it's not through Moses. It's not through Moses. Now, ironically, my father is, um, and even that's kind of contentious depending on who you speak to. And I'll quick, I'm just going to go through this really quickly because it's not directly relevant to Moses. <laughs> so I would like, I would prefer to use Pocahontas's actual name, but I always struggle with pronouncing it. So I'm going to, plus everyone knows her as Pocahontas, so I'm just going to stick with Pocahontas. She had a previous marriage or relationship with a man called Cocoon, who was also, you know, he was, he was indigenous, Native American. They, this is the contentious bit. There's a whole side of her white line who denies all of this, but the Powhatan nation insists that what I'm telling you is correct because I actually went to them because I didn't believe it myself. So they had a daughter called Kaoki, who's also known as Jane Powhatan. She married a Pettis, who's believed to be Thomas Pettis, and they are the parents of my Fugate Clark line down in the southwest of Virginia. Anyone who knows this family, they are the people with the blue skin pigment. I carry the gene. So, I mean, I know that I'm a member of that, that particular family, and 
According to the indigenous oral history and tradition, the Fugate Clark line is a direct, our direct descendants of Pocahontas, and my father is a direct descendant of the Fugate Clarks. She had another child with John Rolfe, named Thomas, po Thomas Powhatan Rolfe. His line, that's the white line. That line is nailed down. It's just mm -hmm. nailed down. Um, that's it. So that's it. So it's it's it's, yeah, it's, it's I, basically I read, those two. I gotta read this funny. Uh, it's not funny. Uh, Erica Morgan. She said, "Which Moses Williams are we researching?" I have five on my tree. <laughs> 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 it's so funny. I got you beat. I got now. twelve. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right. So we, we all got more than five. But when we start, we're talking about the the main Moses. We're talking about Moses the Elder, seventeen sixty nine. So let's move on to the children because I don't want us to run out of time. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to go to the kids. What I want to do is I'm going to say their names. I'm going to just go through their names very quickly so everybody know who they are, and then we're going to kind of focus on certain ones um so for the first wife we have one two three four five six seven twelve eight, it's, nine, it's ten, eleven twelve children um that we know oh, it is right there my bad uh twelve children that we know come from moses and his first wife their names are sarah Alec, moses jr which is the one that started this whole debacle celia um violet mary nelly Eda, or etta or edith we're not her, these are one of her names and what they go by. Martha Ann, Lucretia, Francis, and an unknown daughter where we know we have direct connections to her, but we are not sure as far as what it, you know, who she is. Then for the second wife, there are nine children. And the second wife, we do know her name as Mariah Stallworth. Her children. She also had a daughter named Celia. However, we are under the impression that this Celia is a daughter-in-law and not a child. So in, in, we're going to say eight or nine kids right here. Mm -hmm. And then there's Rose Williams, Matilda, Margaret, Elizabeth, John, Annie, Effie, and Caroline. So those are the confirmed children that we know. And if you look at these particular, as you look at the names and who they married or had children by, it's everywhere. We got Elams, Adams, Settles, Deans, um, Stalling. Holloway, Mackey, Holloway. Sla Mackey slash Key. There's Deans in there too. Mm -hmm. Yes. All everybody. of these people. Keys, Petersons, <laughs> Gilchrist, you know, everybody. Gilchrist, everybody, McManuses. So this is why all of those people are related and why we all are connected. We also were mm -hmm. able to find out that Moses had two siblings. Their names were Caesar and Charlotte. We do know that those are definite siblings. So if you're finding information under Major John Williams, for example, and you're finding information for him, and you see this, it's probably Caesar's kids, not Moses. And they're probably Moses's cousins. They are, not probably. They're Moses's cousins, not his children. So with that being said, we already talked about Moses Jr. Do we want to go to Violet briefly? Real brief? Sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. So Violet Williams married Peter Peterson. That oh. is my Peterson line. What was you going to say, Brian? Just real quick. So what you see on the left-hand side is a medical book called The Anomalies and Curiosities of Medicine. This is the medical book, and you can download it for free on Google Books. And I think it's also available on um, Internet Archives. This is the medical book that Moses is mentioned in. So that's that's why that's up there. Yes, yes. And then the other thing, oh, we have to do this before we get into those kids. We need to discuss the newspapers. One of the things that happened that we really had an issue with was the fact that people would look at the newspapers and say things like, oh, well, this is not him because of when the paper was done. Guys, newspapers were social media back in the day. So the stuff was constantly being recycled over and, and over and over again. 
and with us constantly being re it being recycled, we know for a fact there is a, a, a um the article that shows that Moses died 1884. It was written 1884. If you look at this post that's listed on here, it says the fecundity of the Negro race, although well known, is always a matter of discussion and interest. The New York Evening Post on July 28, 1890. Three reported that one Moses Williams, a Negro farmer in Raleigh, North Carolina, 65 years old, as nearly as he could make out, but who did not appear to be over 50, had married twice and had begotten 45 children. And by his, by his two wives, there were 50 grandchildren. Now, here's the kicker: that article was written in 1922, in 1892, in 1893, in eight, and and then there's another one actually when he was alive and that was what 18 he would have been at 65 whatever that age is I, i'm 18. sorry i didn't uh -huh. it's 65 years old that article's 1893 it would have him being born in 1828 so we know uh -huh. he so was we born. Know that that, yeah. exactly it's like exactly. that childhood game that that childhood whispering game you know uh, you could have 10 kids whispering something and he you know starts off with one story by the time it gets to that to that last kids there's elements of the story in there but then there's lots of differences and that's what happened you, and at least the papers are calling out the other papers that have informed the story exactly I think and I think part of the fascination for Moses, and um, I'm just going to call it for what it is, you know, there is this myth that only black people bred like rabbits. I'm putting it bluntly like that for a reason. Mm -hmm. I know Donnie is normally the one to be the blunt one, but today it's going to be me because I'm not in the captain's chair. There's, you know, that myth that we breed like rabbits. We're not. Right. My Quaker ancestors who are white were, were doing it too. But because, you know, Jim, this is an inherently racist country, this is, I, I'm still convinced to this day, that's why this story kept getting recycled. Black man had 45 kids. Black man had 45 kids. Black man had 45 kids. People are like, oh my God, oh my God. Even to the, t well, actually, funnily enough, even to this day, if you, look, if you look at the comments on our Facebook page for this episode, people are like, 45 kids, really? Oh my God. Um, so, it, you know, it still kind of jars you to this day. And I guess, you know, if it was a slow news day, it was a really easy story to um to repurpose. Why? Because it was verified. And just understand and know that the original article actually ended with this has been verified. Verified. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling that's, you now, the man had know. he had more than 50 grandkids. I'm telling you that now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that. Forget that bit. During during that time, it was way more than fifty grandkids because we already found more than fifty grandkids. Mm -hmm. So time. my my advice to researchers in general is if you are reading a newspaper article about your ancestor that is written well after they died, there will be elements of the truth of whatever story about them. It will be in there, but there's going to be a lot of incorrect information. I have no proof that Moses ever lived in Raleigh, North Carolina. Fayetteville was the other place that was mentioned in one of those other articles. I remember how long I spent trying to find a trace of him in Fayetteville. Mm -hmm. Couldn't find a thing. The article was actually posted in a newspaper in Texas as well. That yes. I found. Yeah. It was so posted that... in Texas. Exactly. So with that being said, we have like 10 minutes left, actually a little less than 10 minutes. Um, we the, the children that we actually, who the children that we research the most right now that we sit on top of is Moses Jr., Violet, Martha Ann, um, I want to say Lucretia, Matilda, and Matilda, which is on the next page. I've just started working with um, our cousin Yolanda Schubert on Edie, Edie, mm -hmm. Edith, getting right. getting getting that yeah. line done. Mm -hmm. So to the Garretts, if you want to know how we're related, he, it is this lady right here. This is your this is your connection to everybody, as well. So with that being said, um, I think the main person that we kind of really focused on, if it wasn't Violet, it was Martha Ann. 
Do you want to talk about Martha Ann real quick? Because she's the guru. Loretta is the overall guru when it comes to that Settles family. I don't research them either. Um, well, Loretta, Loretta and Ahmad. Yeah, me and Ahmad do it. Hamad does. Um, Hamad, who unfortunately, um, our condolences go out to Hamad. Um, yes, lost his father. Um, he's actually sent me a text message. Um, he's uh, um, attending his father's services right now. So we send our best wishes mm-hmm. to Hamad. Um, Hamad and I split the subtles because it is such a large and vast family. Um, so I do predominantly the African American subtles. And Hamad does the white settles. And that's the only way that we can really get the research done without bumping heads. So we split it up. So um, Martha Ann um, had relationships with uh, Ed Settles, um, Edward Horace Settles, who was a white man. And they fathered several children. Um, The children that I have that I believe are Edwards are Isabella, Charlotte, James, Molly, Raleigh and Wesley. Um, there is another child that she, ha- I believe, is her child, but not Edward's child. Is Preston Suttles? It's still a question mark because we already have DNA confirmation that Preston is not a full um, brother to Raleigh and Wesley because his DNA does not match. However, that doesn't mean that he's not Martha's child. It just means he's not Edward's child. Okay, but I still, right. I'm a firm believer that he's Martha's child. Um, I mean, we have DNA matches that to mark to him, right? Yeah, we, there's DNA matches to Preston as well. Yeah. Um, so, if you my tree is public, it wasn't public, but it's public now. If you want to know anything about Martha, um, definitely go on and check the tree out. But I believe she had six children with Edward. Um, like I said, the rumors are eleven total, um, but still yet to be proven that there were um, other kids out there. Right. So um, most of you probably know the story of, uh, if, I, if I had to pick one of her children that are most known, it's probably Wesley. Wesley, as you know, in short, was the school teacher who uh, who the white folks came to kill. Um, he was a school teacher. He taught uh, black folks how to read. He had a school, um, burned the school down several times. They uh, came after him, tried to kill him, and his brother and his nephew saved his life. And there's a whole big story. And I actually, I was able to find the newspaper clipping because when when I first started the Suttles research, that was kind of a myth. I heard stories. I had been to the family reunion, and I actually found a newspaper article that detailed the events of that. So that is a real story. So for those of you who don't believe about what happened with Wesley, it's true. It made the news. Wow. Now, I've seen a couple of people say that they have Williams in South Carolina. My advice to you, because Williams is such an incredibly common name, right. is that if your ancestry extends from, I would say Abbeville, anywhere in the old 96 down to North Augusta, you need to find an unbroken line of males in your family and get someone living to take a Y DNA test and then go to that Y DNA Williams family study to see which Williams family group that you come in, because that will really help you narrow your focus. Mm -hmm. If you're, if your Williams isn't a descendant of John, the wealthy Welshman, you're going to waste so much time trying to figure out how your Williams fits into a family that they're not related to. Um, And unfortunately, it's the same if your surname is is just common, like Brown, Williams, um, sorry, just Evans, you know, just just those really kind of popular surnames. That's where why DNA test can really, really help you and, um, and save you some time. Well, that's good. Um, and I agree. And I was actually thinking the same thing, Brian, because the name um, Williams is so common. You can have that in your DNA. But the thing is, here's the thing that you really have to realize. Even if you have Williams in your DNA, the names are not may not always be Williams because he had more girls than boys. So the names change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and Although a lot of the a lot of the daughters who co- and I'm not going to say they were married they cohabitated with people yes. in the, in the slavery period, their their kids took their surname 
they didn't take their father's surname. So they're carrying, they're still carrying the name Williams they're because their mother, Williams. their mother was a Williams. Well, then that's good. But still, you have to think about that because of the fact that when a, when a child marries on, they definitely, the name changes. And the, for a daughter, mm. the name changes. So and that's been the challenge for this is those 40 right. girls, yes. by the time they hit the 1870 census, they were and married women. They were married. Married with kids. That's right. And if their kids were in, and their kids did take, some of them did take daddy's name. So um, that's something else that you need to be mindful of. I do like the fact that Brian suggested you do the YDNA. Now, mm. did we do YDNA? No, I, we, we didn't. But no, only because our autosomal DNA, which can eat, but again, you have to really understand how autosomal works. For us, the the smoking, not even the smoking gun, the definitive proof was having Henderson and Ke white Henderson Keeling DNA relatives mm -hmm. that couldn't have appeared in our in our DNA in any other way except through Daniel. Exactly. And then there's the, the fact that, you know, you got some people who connect in different directions to Moses, but they still go to Moses. So using my mom as an example, my mom is actually a daughter of both Violet and Martha Ann and then um, and Moses. So she covers at least three of the kids. She comes from all three of those children. And, and there is possibly. Huh? And then there's possibly oh, pressure for my mom because mm. my mother is the descendant from both of the women too, both of the grandmothers, which is Miss Haygood and Mariah. So there's another child out there that my mom connects to. And, and again, because our, our family married cousins, mm -hmm. that's the reason why Donia descends from him in different ways. I descend from him at least twice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and my husband- well, How many times do you do it, Loretta? My husband is two, I believe. Ben is two. He comes from two different directions. So mm -hmm. he's he, <laughs> speaking of the Williams side, you know, until you just said get his Y DNA tested because his mother comes from a long Williams line in North Carolina. Oh, wow. Well, th that would be very interesting if it comes from Caswell, Pasquatank, and um, Granville. Mm hmm. Yeah, because those were the three hot spots for for our Williams. Yeah, right. So. so take this information, guys, and 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 utilize it. Store this particular video because we've given you a timeline. We've given you a lot of directions to go. Like for example, on here we've given you links on slide number two. Of I mean, I'm sorry, slide one to tell you where certain things were found and how the information about a secret trust and what it was. We've given you this information for a reason because we want to know how you connect, but we want you to be right about it. Mm -hmm. We don't ever want anybody to say that we did not give you this info. We don't want that. Yeah. And again, it's coming from a place of love and hopefully inspiration because if you're, if you're doubtful that you can research enslaved people, yes, you can. We're talking right. about a man who was born when this country still had British pounds sterling and he wore knee breeches mm -hmm. and died, died a free man wearing trousers. That's all I have to say about that. That's it. That's, That's it. it. You can't, it's nothing else that you can't say. So I thank you guys for joining us today. Um, I really hope that we cleared up some air when it comes to Mr. Moses Williams um, and that I hope that somewhere down the line that we'll get a, a we'll find out how we're all related. So until then, thank you, Loretta, for joining You're us. Welcome. Thank you, for, Brian, for allowing us to to talk about this. Until Love being then, here. I'm Donya, and I thank you guys for joining us. Good night. Take care. Night night. Bye. Bye. <laughs>